Okay, welcome to part three of the uh, same outline. I sent you out a uh, slightly updated and amended outline um, on being blessable is just the beginning. If we want to get blessed and really experience you know, things that God has in store for us, we need to be in the right place. And part of being in the right place is being holy. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that are prerequisites. Uh, and next time or the time thereafter, we'll be looking at blessing busters. But these are the things that are blessing bringers. Uh, believing is surely a means of getting blessed because when you we believe God, uh, we are really uh, honoring him. We're showing that his... his uh, uh, he's trustworthy and then he's kind of set up things that it's as a result of our belief in him that we get those blessings it's also the result of holiness as mentioned previously the whole point of getting israel into the promised land as a separate and distinct people you know not being able to eat certain things having to wear certain things not doing things on the sabbath uh, was to make them a distinct people so that when he blessed them uh, for their obedience, it would be seen that he is the one who blesses, not, you know, Marduk or Baal or, you know, some other uh, demonically uh, powered uh, god. So, uh, we need to be holy, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I left off last week uh, on believing the promises and then believing in Jesus. And... You need to believe in Jesus to um, get forgiveness for your sin because you're alienated from God. Uh, as he said in Isaiah, you know, what is it, 59, 2, your sins have caused a separation so he doesn't hear you. Um, and we basically need to get the penalty of our sin covered so we don't experience uh, eternal death. The word for forgive has a, a richer meaning than most people talk about. Uh, it means to take up and away. And uh, the blessing is not just getting forgiven, but getting the sins removed from our life. A and the key to that, remember there's two words for sin, uh, transgression, where you step over the line and disobey direct command of scripture, and then a hamartia, which means missing the mark. And we, we don't live as God wanted. We don't follow his way. So, as we see things about walking in his way, um, it's walking in the way of wisdom, uh, the way that pleases him. And uh, I am totally, utterly convinced that the vast majority of Christians are not pleasing to God because they don't do the stuff that pleases God. And yet he's at work in us to willing to do his good pleasure. So people are resisting his spirit because they think they know better. Uh, it kind of goes back to fear of God when I covered that earlier. I should have jumped up and down on this a little more. But for, for us to read God's word and uh, say, I'm going to just going to follow the dictates of my own heart rather than that. There's no fear of God. That makes us wicked. Uh, that makes us, um, yeah, the sin is still covering, uh, it's still clinging to us. So, in order to get your sins forgiven, you all know First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. And then there's the second part, cleanse and remove the stuff that causes us grief. He has set up the world that if we sin, we suffer negative consequences. We suffer negative consequences and some people will blame God, some people will blame others. But it's really ourselves that are at fault because God has made all the grace available to us to do his will. I want to focus again on that word for confess. It's homo legumia. Homo means the same. Legumia is to speak. It's to speak the same thing about our actions that God says about them. And people have trouble doing this. Over the years as I've looked at people who... Um, have just not been able to free themselves from their sin and have all kinds of grief in their life, it's because they fail to acknowledge that their actions are sin. They minimize the consequences of the sin. 
And that's exactly what Eve did uh, in her interaction with uh, Satan. She minimized the blessings of obedience and minimized the consequences for disobedience. And you can go back to uh, Daily Truth based on Genesis 3 uh, to see how the language clearly points that out. Uh, you know, freely eat, surely die. And she just said, eat and die. And then Satan said, oh, no, he didn't say that. She said, oh, okay. Uh, so you've got to acknowledge the sin. I, I think of some one person in particular who oh, was doing a whole bunch of stuff that was wrong. And they were in leadership. And part of my job as a leader is to point out the sin, particularly in other leaders. Um, and the after you know, writing out you know, pages of how this person was sinning even stuff that they committed to and failed to do and you know lots of other things the the most i could get out of them is oh it wasn't optimal <laughs> well it's an optimal <laughs> it's like yeah i i took a non-optimal dose of uh poison <laughs> yeah. it's it's pride that keeps us from doing that and you know part of that's things from upbringing and being overly criticized and developing this defensive shell but in, unless we really see things from God's perspective and call sin, sin, it's going to stick with us, folks. So we need to confess it, forsake it, have God cleanse us from it. And then verse 8 kicks in, blessed is the man, woman, child to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. What in the world does impute mean? It's the word logizomai, has the logic of reckoning, accounting, and... Uh, I just kind of, this past week, dug a little deeper in terms of, it, it means to charge someone with something. That's one of its meanings. And we have to ask the question, can God charge me with sin? And uh, we want to basically have a clear conscience uh, so that, you know, we're not aware of anything against God or man. Uh, Paul said, in this do I exercise myself in the book of Acts. <clears throat> to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and man. So, you know, if I offended God, if I, you know, he, he's given me some instructions and I just cast them behind my back. Psalm 50 says that is a person who is wicked, who takes the law on the lips and casts the sin behind their back. All right, so let's go on to new and exciting things. Okay. <laughs> so this believing uh, up above having faith, um, so Galatians, those who are of faith, who exercise faith rather than just a ritualistic performance of externals, are blessed with the believing Abraham. And uh, in Romans oh, 8, oh, I think it's 8 or 5, 8, somewhere around there. Maybe it's 5, 8. Um, and also back in Genesis, it says, Abraham believed God and he, in the Greek translation, it's logizomai, credited to him as being righteous. So being righteous is being right with God, doing what's right in God's sight. So Abraham believed and God said, you're doing what's right in my sight. Therefore, you get blessed. If we're not doing what's right in God's sight, we're not going to get blessed. And that's what sanctification is all about. This is being set apart, made holy. And we get the word saint from this in the English language. Um, in Acts, uh, I guess it's Peter, God raised up his servant Jesus and sent him to bless you. Okay, when is this happening, folks? After he was resurrected, he sent him to bless you. How did he, how does, how, how does Jesus bless us? Um, after he's been raised from the dead and died for our sins. There's something more than just getting our sins forgiven. By turning everyone away from your iniquities. Iniquities is another form for evil and sin. So how does he do that? Well, through the uh, apostles, uh, particularly in Acts 26, 18, when he commissions Paul. Uh, oh, there it is right there. Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes because 
they just don't see. And they got to have their eyes opened so they can turn from the darkness that they're in to the light. You know, when you're in the dark with your eyes closed, you can't see the light. <laughs> you don't even know that there is light. Then light comes in. But if you have your eyes shut, you're not going to see the light. And turning from darkness to light is being turned from the power of Satan, who is ruling over this world and everybody's life, pre-Christ, and most people's life, post-Christ, to the power of God. This is not some positional truth that means nothing. Uh, this is the reality. You have to do that, post-Christ being turned from darkness to light, that you may receive forgiveness of sins, sins before Christ and sins after Christ, and get an inheritance. Forgiveness and inheritance, two different things. Nation of Israel, the, put the blood of the Paschal Lamb over their doorpost, the death angel passed over them, but the sins were covered. But the inheritance was given to only those who are sanctified, made holy, and that being made holy is by faith in Christ. Now, that doesn't preclude obeying him, because he says, if you love me, obey me. If you believe that he is the Lord and master and coming king and the one be whom, before whom you're going to stand to see if you've been pleasing in his sight, according to Second uh, Corinthians uh, 4 and 5, those two chapters, then you're going to put, uh, believe what he said and do it. And that's what the next thing should say. Or something similar. Obedience. Okay. This is learning and then the law and then living the law of the Lord. Uh, there's so many evangelicals and of course forget about most of the mainline people who fail to understand that God gave the law so people could have a relationship with him for thousands of years before Jesus came. And the, we still have to fulfill the law. Romans 8, the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk uh, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So the spirit's at work in us to help us walk in the way that's pleasing to God. It's not like he said, okay, Israel, uh, I want you and everyone to walk this particular way because that pleases me and I will bless you. And then Jesus comes and, ah, forget about it all. <laughs> you know, no, it, it, it's the same thing. This is the same God. Uh, man, one of my favorite Psalms uh, is Psalm 119. Um, I believe it was written by Ezra. And it talks about all the blessings of those who follow the law of the Lord. Where does it start? Right at the bat. You always, always look at what's right at the beginning. Blessed are the people who are undefiled in the way. Who are they? Those who walk in the law of the Lord. In other words, they have ordered their life, that's the walking, according to what God has specified. And if they don't do that, they are defiled. You know, what is a defiled person? Uh, they're basically dirty, uh, unclean, not allowed into the temple can't come in to worship God and get blessings from him. They're excluded. So when you're defiled, you your worship's not acceptable and you don't get blessed. So through every culture, you find the people offering sacrifices to God, so the gods, so they'll get blessed. Normally the blessings are fertility. Uh, they, they, you needed fertility for your land, for your crops, for your family, for you know, your, your town, otherwise it just dies. And, uh, you know, every time I travel and I see these towns that are just uh, the ruins, <laughs> so the tourists come to see, <laughs> uh, you have to think, what happened that caused these things to turn into ruins? And uh, it's basically sin, for the most part, uh, it's caused that to happen. Uh, you look at the nation of Israel, what happened to that fantastic temple that Solomon built? Well, God destroyed it. What about the fantastic temple that Herod rebuilt? Uh, God just let people destroy it. Why? Because Israel was not keeping their covenantal relationship with him, living according to the 
things he specified. So, blessed are those, look, the next verse, to emphasize, this is parallelism, Hebrew poetry, for emphasis, who keep his testimonies, what he told us he wants. They're the ones who seek him with the whole heart. They don't dabble in discipleship. They follow the Lord Jesus. Uh, interesting, the word for obedience in the Gospel of John, I don't think it's there. But the word that is there is keeping his commandments, keeping his testimonies. And then there's the whole part, seeking him with the whole heart. Uh, that means in all that you do, including your work, it's worship. Um, you know, do your work heartily as unto the Lord. That's, that's like not a suggestion. That's actually a command in Colossians 3. Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance of the Lord Jesus, whom you serve. We work to serve our boss so he'll like us and promote us. We work to please ourselves. Uh, we need to be thinking about how do we work to please the Lord? And that way you get a second paycheck. One from your company, hopefully, and before they go bankrupt, and one from the... Uh, Lord when he returns. Now, in, in terms of learning the law, right, uh, one of the things you see in uh, Islam is they, they go into a place, they build a school, and uh, they gather people together, They're funded by outside sources, because it can't be self-supporting, and uh, they have people memorize and recite the Quran even though they have no idea what it means. It's considered meritorious. Well, we're supposed to love God with all our mind, you know, heart, soul, and strength. Uh, he created us and gave us commands that appeal to our mind. There's got to be understanding. Uh, it's just, if you, you, you're just doing things by rote. It, you're an animal. There's like, it's an instinct. It, it's, there's no, nothing cognitive going on. So, blessed is the man whom you instruct. Okay, I, I basically spend most of my life teaching. And uh, I teach so people will understand things that are really beneficial for them. Um, and I want them to get it and be able to not regurgitate it, but apply it to various situations. Um, much to the chagrin of my students, why don't you just give us multiple guest tests? <laughs> because life isn't a multiple guest thing. <laughs> you need to be able to think. But look, when God instructs someone, he's teaching them out of his law. When was the last time God taught you something? I remember I had a really annoying fellow student, uh, in, uh, I guess it was Campus Crusades, and maybe also also followed me, we, well, we went over to NAVS, who would go around saying, um, you know, what are you memorizing here? What's the Lord teaching you? <laughs> and uh, I've actually you know, visited it with him in our older age. Uh, he's still doing the same thing. Oh, still okay. annoying. <laughs> but we're supposed to be learning. And then we're supposed to teach one another, admonish one another, instruct one another. But it starts with God teaching us, and then we can reach out and teach others. Uh, that's part of what's the Great Commission? Teaching them to obey. So if there's no obedience, there's really no teaching that has gone on. Um, if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. Except in the case of the Lord. He has taught. People have to listen. And what you see throughout the scriptures, I can't think of any book of the Bible or any character that wrote a book where they aren't trying to correct the fact that people aren't getting it. <laughs> you know, if you just had the Ten Commandments and obeyed it, that would be it. It could fit in an index card. Uh, it's amazing that people can no longer recite, you know, more than two commandments <laughs> from the surveys. Um, do unto others before they do unto you. No, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not a good command. All right, so the one who gets blessed is the one that learns to listen to the Lord. I mean, how can you, you know, how can you get instructed unless you're listening to what he has to say? And in Proverbs chapter 8, this is the one on wisdom, you know, blah, 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 um, and how it's a foundational 
base of our uh, universe, even that's from creation onward. Um, yeah, this morning uh, I heard a podcast. Uh, I think it was about three thirty a.m. So uh, for, for decades, I have woken up after six hours of sleep, and I learned that people who don't get eight hours don't live as long. So I've been trying to stretch out my sleeping time. So I listen to podcasts, and uh, I can find some people who put me to sleep. Um, and I uh, hit upon someone today uh, that actually kept me awake because they were saying some good stuff, and I'll share some of that stuff I learned with you. But they had... Uh, kind of a understand, definition of wisdom, uh, mine has always been, uh, it's choosing the right objectives and the right means of obtaining the objectives, and it's looking forward, and it's totally accurate based on the scriptures. But th he actually combined understanding with it and insight, and he, he put a front end onto it, and I, I've talked about this, but I never tied it directly to wisdom. It, it's understanding that the effect that we have what it was caused by. We, if we want to live wisely, we need to understand why we are like we are, so we can then understand how, what do we have to be like to get where we want to be. All right, so it's got a, a past component and a future component. And most people wind up in difficulties and they um, just say, oh, God, get me out of this. And God's gracious and he'll deliver them. Um, but they don't understand how they got there in the first place. Uh, they, they're very much unself-aware. Uh, and God wants us to be aware of where we've been so we can help others and we can go in a different direction if where we've been is not a good spot. So, blessed is a man who listens to me, watching daily, daily, Toothpaste, folks, at my gates, waiting on me. I think I repeated it's down below. Yeah, okay. And so I went back and actually added this in because the context is pretty important. Um, therefore, listen to me, my children. This is wisdom speaking. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Gee, I've never heard that before. No, you have. Hear instruction and be wise. Don't be, what's the alternative to being wise? Being a fool. And uh, being a fool is someone who reaps really negative consequences. And do not disdain it. Do not disdain instruction. Do not think, oh, I know better. Oh, I don't think that. Yeah, we do think that. When, when we don't obey God, we are saying, God doesn't know what he's talking about. I know better. See, who was one of the first ones who said that? I think it was Lucifer. Um, so we need to be listening for what God wants to tell us. Um, I remember when I first uh, got around, oh, it was a crusade with the Navs, probably a crusade. Uh, someone was talking about um, when you pray, just don't bring your laundry list of stuff to the Lord and ask. You know, I want this, I need this, oh, I need help on this test, I need help with this relationship, I need tuition, I need this, I need that. Um, he said, it's kind of like, you know, knocking on your girlfriend's door and uh, dropping off your bag of dirty laundry and saying, oh, this is great, let's do this again <laughs> next week. Yeah, you know, that, that's, you know, kind of a flat nose because she slams the door in his face. So, um, we need to be listening. Uh, you know, I've there are people who spend uh, lots of time listening to their own desires and thinking that's the Lord. No, you need to listen to the word, what he said, and then give him a chance to say uh, whatever he wants to address. Uh, people are big on, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, but the last part of that says, uh, search me, O God, and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and guide me in the way of life everlasting. How is he going to relate to you, communicate to you that you're doing something wrong? You got to listen and wait. God, is there anything you want to tell me? God, you know, um, I have ears to hear. Remember Jesus was really big on having ears to hear? 
the churches in Revelation, people did not have ears to hear, and that's why they were not victorious. So, blessed is the man who listens to me, that's the same verse that's up above, watching daily at my gates and waiting at the post of my doors. Okay, watching and waiting. Being on guard, listening, and then waiting for a response. Uh, we don't want to be like, was it Pilate or Herod who said, what is truth, and then didn't stick around for the answer. For whoever finds me, this is why you get blessed, okay? 34, blessed, this person who does this, and the reason is because whoever finds me finds life. Who's the me? Jesus? No, it's wisdom. So you need to find wisdom, discover wisdom, and then you can obtain favor, that's grace, from the Lord. All these people are so big on grace. Grace is not, oh, that's okay. Grace is power. Grace is blessing. Uh, grace is so much more. It's the you know, root word is favor, uh, because you please the Lord. However, he, she, or they who sin against wisdom, who follow the foolish way, the broad way to destruction, is wronging their own soul. You're committing spiritual and psychological, and in some cases, physical suicide by not paying attention to the warnings of wisdom. But that takes time, right? Daily waiting, watching. And all who hate me love death. Oh, I don't hate wisdom. I think wisdom's a great thing. Okay, what kind of relationship do you have with wisdom? Remember, love and hate, covenantal terms. Love is to have a covenantal relationship. You look at Malachi 1 and Daily Truth Base to, to prove that. And hate is you don't want a covenantal relationship with. What's a covenantal relationship? So if the responsibilities of each party are spelled out. Now, God's responsibilities and what he will do is spelled out really clearly. He also spelled out our responsibilities and what are the consequences, positive or negative. So if you don't uh, cultivate this relationship with God, then you're not going to get blessed. Blessed is the one who listens to me watching daily at his gates. Then, when you know what, figure out what God's will is. Yeah, that, that's the big question. What, what's God's will? Well, how do you find out what God's will is? Oh, it's what I want. No, it's what God wants. <laughs> Blessed are those servants. Remember, we're supposed to be servants of God. Um, I think the actual word here is slaves. We're listening to one guy who spent this whole sermon on the fact that uh, every time you see the word servant or bond servant, it really is a slave. Uh, no rights whatsoever. Lowest to the low. Uh, John the Baptist said, I, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. And John the Baptist was the biggest, best thing. He would have been a major social media influencer. <laughs> Was he around today? When those servants, when, when the master comes, we'll find him watching for him. So this is in Luke 12. The last half of Luke are some of the scariest passages in the scripture for me about knowing God's will and also what the consequences of those who don't do his will. But I'll let you discover those on your own. Instead, I'll pick up the happier stuff up above uh, the end of the chapter. Uh, talking about all the things we seek after. You know, what the Gentiles, non-believers, uh, the heathen seek after. What do they seek after? Power, pleasure, and possessions. Uh, they want safety. They want status. Status, status, status. Worth and value. Oh, it's just it's so disheartening to see how many people have gotten damaged because the, the, their parents did such a crappy job of affirming them. And that's because the parents don't have a sense of worth and value, so they have nothing to give to someone else. But seek the kingdom of God first, says Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And all these other things will be added to you. I remember a specific time in college, I embraced that. And it changed my job focus, it changed uh, my life. And it's been true. Um, 
and you know the stuff that I thought I would be delighted with, I got, and eh, all right, no big deal. I remember at the time, uh, the most uh, exciting thing I'd done was open up a restaurant. It's like, wow, this is creative. There's so many parts you put them together, and you know, it, it's 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 really uh, designing and creating and uh, organizing and all kinds of fun stuff. And then uh, I turned down a great job and got a, another job where I wound up opening, most of you know this, uh, I think it was 15 food service operations in like a year, year and a half. I can't remember exactly what. Um, but then I said, boy, this just doesn't satisfy. <laughs> I got what I wanted and it's not there. But at the same time, I was, in one reason I turned down one job is I wanted to understand how to make disciples. That was the most rewarding thing I have ever done and I, anything I continue to do. Um, major part of that is the understanding of the scriptures that it's forced me to have. So my treasure was my reward in the kingdom of God, and that's where my heart was. And I've seen over, you know, 40, 50 years. Yeah, wow, it's been over 50 years. I must be old. Um, that God has provided this stuff. And uh, it, it's like, I, I know he's got even better stuff for me in the future. So, I guess I need to help you apply this. What is the treasure that you seek? If it's temporal, if it's something you can see, if it's something just on this earth, you're being deceived. It's fool's gold. Um, it looks like gold, but it doesn't have any currency for the future. I remember uh, when I was a wee tight, we went cross country and we went to the Snake River uh, somewhere in the West, the Rockies. And uh, we, we got these little things and panned for gold and you got, you, you could actually get these little flecks, but it was called Fool's Gold, pie right or something. It, it, it was, but you know, it's like, oh, wow, we found gold, you know, um, but it's nothing. And I probably put in a little box and then, you know, lost it in one of the moves because it was worthless. We spend our life going after stuff that uh, really doesn't satisfy. Um, and our heart goes after that. And if we treasure God in his word, um, then things will go well with us. If we don't, you know, uh, we'll lose. And I don't like being a loser. Uh, be like those who wait for their master. The word is wait is to expect and return. And we could go down here. I got a couple other verses on what we can be looking for, but it's this expectation for the master. Uh, I always used to think people were a little odd who were looking forward to Jesus's return. And I think it was because they were told in church, you're supposed to look forward to Jesus's return. Oh yeah. I'm just so looking forward to Jesus's return. Uh, why, why is that? Oh, cause when he returns, everything's going to be wonderful. Oh, uh, all right. So as I began to understand the scriptures, his return is not going to be wonderful for the vast majority of people because everyone is going to appear before his judgment seat to receive according to what they've done, whether good or evil. And that's why Paul made it his ambition to please God, right? That's what 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 9, and 10 say. So we need to be like those who wait for their master when he re will return from the wedding so that when he comes and knocks, they may open up to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find them watching. The word is vigilant. And then he will actually bless them. He will gird himself, kind of like the Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet, have them sit down to eat and will serve them. Okay, so that... I'm not sure if Jesus is going to actually do that in the um, kingdom, but he is going to have a sit down to eat and he's probably going to have his angels wait on us. Kind of like the elves in uh, Harry Potter doing the feasts. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this word looking and expecting. Titus 2.13 um, we're supposed to be looking, expecting for the blessed hope. And the NIV translated this correctly. It's even the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Um, people say, look at the glorious appearing. No, it's the appearing of the glory. I just can't believe so many people who should know better have translated and commentated, commented on this incorrectly. If you just look it up in an in interlinear, uh, even a you know, person with extremely limited background could just look at the words and see what's the order and what they mean, uh, and what part of speech they are. And glory is a noun, it's not an adjective. And uh, we're supposed to be uh, expecting eagerly the appearing of the glory. Why? Because we know we're living to get that glory. Okay, what do we have next? Oh, Jude, 121. Uh, keep or guard yourselves in the love of God. You have any idea how to do that? Make sure that you are loving God. And what do you have to do to love God? Hmm, what did Jesus say? Oh, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh yeah, that's it, right? So make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're not being unfaithful to him. Just like in a marriage relationship or any other thing, you are wanting to be, keep yourself um, faithful to God. Uh, otherwise, you're unfaithful and you get cursed. And as we're looking for that, we are, I mean, guarding ourselves, we are looking and expecting the mercy or hesed of our Lord Jesus for the end goal of dominion of the age. You can look up Jude 121 on Daily Truth Base for uh, the word mercy is the, uh, the Greek word translated mercy is the one that translates hesed in the Septuagint uh, translation of the Old Testament, Greek translation of the Old Testament. And uh, most people, vast majority of translators totally miss that. Uh, we're looking for Jesus to come back and fulfill his covenantal promises because we are fulfilling our covenantal obligations. It's that simple. Uh, another thing that can help you get blessing is faithful and wise obedience. Blessed is that servant who, whom his master, when he comes, will find them so doing. Doing, doing, doing. Doing is important. What kind of doing? Not random acts of activity or random acts of love, but purposefully doing what pleases God because we figured out what his will is for us on a daily basis in every relationship, in every decision that we make. Okay, back to the Proverbs 8. Uh, I've thrown this in before, before. Listen to me, children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Learn and obey. Blessed. Are, oh, yes, is uh, somebody cried out to you. Blessed are the, you know, the womb that bear you, or the breast that nursed you. And he says, more so, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Okay, the vast, I'm not sure if I can say this is the vast majority of Christendom. I'm not sure how the numbers, but a large, large proportion of Orthodox and Roman uh, Catholicism idolize Mary um, but more blessed than she who deserves the blessing because you know she heard the word of God and kept it Jesus now expands that to you and me blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it obey it uh, in John 13 Jesus says if you know these things blessed are you if you pray about them if you say, oh yeah, somebody else should be doing that. No, if you do them. So what is it that you actually have learned from God that you do? Think about that. One of the reasons I put together toil was to enable people to have their daily activities tied back to the ultimate goal of glorifying God. And if you go through toil, it's just a step-by-step, -step, very logical progression as to how you bring the purpose that God created you down to what you do tonight and tomorrow, in this next week, in this next year, in your relationships, in your job, in your thought life, in each thing. But we have a tendency to deceive ourselves. James 125, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer. Oh yeah, I heard something about it. I don't know what it was. 
but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So Martin Luther really didn't like the book of James because it didn't fit his, I can't do anything, fatalistic, I don't have a will. Uh, Martin Luther did great things, but uh, he had feet of clay. And, uh, you know, there, there are lots of people who get some things right, and uh, not everybody, no one gets everything correct. <laughs> but it talks about a person looking in the mirror. Well, why do you look in a mirror? To see if you're still there? <laughs> um, you know, I look in a mirror to see that I haven't turned into a zombie overnight uh, and to see if my eyes are still working. But most people look into a mirror and they'll, they'll work on fixing something, right? They, they see, <gasps> you know, I've got that spot. You know, my hair is here. Right? It's, it's, yeah. um, so when we look into the perfect law that gives liberty, which is, okay, you, you have to look at what I did on Daily Truth based on this because most people, People, we're supposed to so speak and do as those who will be judged by the royal law of liberty or love. This, James is, has this thing we're supposed to uh, be paying attention to, and it's going to judge us in the future day, and most people are clueless. Uh, I'll give you the definition. You can go to Daily Truth based on James 1 and uh, see how James explains it, which I point out to you. God's love has met my needs, so I am free to meet others' needs. I don't have to use others to meet my needs. I can be perfectly content with, I could actually be content with being a hermit. It's more fun not being a hermit. <laughs> but um, most people use others to meet their needs. And God has designed the body so that we reinforce each other's uh, beliefs that are accurate. One of the things I, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a sermon on this one in the future because it's, it's kind of cool. I heard this morning, uh, I love neurobiology and uh, I love the findings of neurobiology. And I actually sent to those on the mailing list um, the article uh, that clues you into the principle. Uh, this professor at Northwestern University, um, I guess it measures brain waves <laughs> and he's been doing this for over 10 years. And his, um, the, the helpful thing, the article is unhelpful in that <laughs> his life is simple, and less stressful if he doesn't have to make any decisions. So uh, he, he, he doesn't look at it. He always gets a special at the restaurant because he doesn't want to have to look at the menu and make decisions. Uh, even the restaurant choice, if he's going to go out with someone, he lets them pick the restaurant because he doesn't want to have to make decisions. It's like, uh, this guy's a little weird. I guess that's what's happening. You look at brain scans for 10 years. But uh, I knew this from uh, some studies I heard about 40 years ago. In, 50 years ago? Wow, it was 50 years ago in uh, one of my Psych 101 classes that, or might have been an upper level. Uh, uh, they did an experiment where people walked into a wait, doctor's waiting room and uh, they had a, either a very uh, anxious, uh, very angry, a very um, happy mood, and the, the person with the and they emoted it, and the person with the strongest emotion affected all the other people in the room. Okay, what this doctor has found, and this explains so much, um, that w when people start interacting with other people. Uh, before they're aware of any conscious act, their brain waves are in sync. This explains the fanaticism of sports people. It explains why churches, I always used to kind of, uh, kind of devalue, I'm not sure if the word is devalue, but uh, I'm not even sure what the right word is. Uh, I wasn't thrilled with the way churches would always keep their people in church. Yeah. Sunday morning, Sunday school, or they had it after the sermon, they had the sermon and Sunday school on either side of it. Then they had a Sunday night service. Then they had a Wednesday night service. Then they had uh, you know, a, a, a prayer night. And then they had uh, a men's breakfast. And, you know, it's just like um, the, the reason that they do this is because uh, they recognize that the people who always are showing up tend to uh, embrace the right values. 
So in, in this uh, study that, that, that I did, he said that you, you, you need to be around the people who are going to get you where you want to go. And uh, so you figure out where, you know, where you want to be and then you get there. And But you do it based on what Solomon said, the one who walks with the wise will be wise. Uh, and on the flip side, Paul said, uh, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals, character, intentions, because we are influenced by the people we hang around. And if you are a uh, Myers-Briggs kind of feeler, that is particularly true, um, that you do become like the people you hang around. So make sure that you're hanging around the good people. There's at one church that I know of that's at Old Decent, it doesn't encourage fellowship, and that's part of part of it is being a body. We're supposed to be connected, and this is one of the ways that connection has, but of the future sermon. Okay, so you look into the word, you, you do what it says, and you get blessed because of what you do. Actually, not just because, but in what you do. This is another theme that you should have seen through here, that you become um, blessed in whatever your tasks are when you're pleasing to God. Revelation, last book of the Bible, things that Martin Luther and some others never got to. Uh, Augustine might have been another one who kind of lost it. And they're two very influential people, but they should have had the whole counsel of God before they started uh, teaching it. Blessed is the one who reads, and the word is used for reading aloud, uh, and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Book of Revelation is called the Book of Prophecy. But it's not just enough to hear it. You got to keep those things which are in it, for the time is near. What time is near? The time for judgment. You go to the last chapters, the one who keeps it is the one who gets blessed. The one who doesn't keep it is the one who gets excluded from the best blessings in the eternity. And there's a whole sermon on the seven churches. Okay. This is one of my favorite verses. Uh, got a couple of them. Deuteronomy. Nation of Israel, after the, the young generation buried the old generation in the desert because of their disobedience for 40 years. So, they're now on the bank of the Jordan. Remember, they, the, God parted the Red Sea for the first generation. He's going to part the Jordan River for the second generation. And they're now... Remember, the first generation didn't believe God, didn't obey him. And even though Numbers 13 and 14 says, you know, they, God forgave them and parted them as at Moses' request, they still reap the negative consequence of no promised land. God's really serious about us doing what he wants. And uh, remember, Moses didn't make it in because God has a higher standard for those who whom much is given, much is required. He hit the rock rather than speaking to the rock, and God said, okay, no promised land for you. However, he is in the kingdom because the Mount of Transfiguration, he and Elijah were there chatting with Jesus. So, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Blessing is an augmentation, good stuff. Curse is a diminishment. It's the word for when the flood waters receded from the ark. Diminished. Do you want a large life or an increasingly small crumb of existence? Okay, here's the blessing. I set before you blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you today. What about that do we not understand? It looks pretty. Obey the commands which God has commanded. So there are 10 there. Elaboration of a lot of the elaboration in the Ten Commandments are uh, how things should work socially. And then there's a curse. There's a curse if you do not obey the commands of the Lord your God. Anybody not understand that? Blessing or curse. And if you're not obeying, you are turning aside from the way of blessing. You're going away from the narrow path that leads up to life, 
said Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and you're taking the broad way to destruction, which is basically Gehenna. Not eternal lake of fire. It's a garbage dump where all that you've given your life to is going to be burned up. I want those words to actually sink into you. All that you're giving your life to is going to go through fire. 1 Corinthians 3 is really clear about this. All believers. And if you have just done the stuff that you want to do, or the stuff that is easy, wood, hay, and stubble, remember that's the stuff that's easy to pick up off the ground, um, your house is going to not exist in the future. But if you've gone after the gold, silver, precious stones, which require sweat and basically you need strength from God to make that happen, you'll receive a reward. But not, it gets burned up. You are saved, very, very clear. But you don't have anything to take into the future. So, that's a choice that we have. Hmm, okay, that means there's a free will. It's not fatalistic. All the false religions are fatalistic. And a lot of uh, Augustine was and uh, Martin Luther were like bondage of the will. We, um, it, we have Erasmus was correct, better scholar than both of them, and he was for the freedom of the will because he saw that we have you know you read the scriptures, your choice, uh, choose life that you may live. It's another one of my verses that might show up on here. Okay, I'm not going to get too far on this. Because I set the timer, I know exactly where I am. <laughs> you know, one of the timers that I set isn't functioning correctly, so that's... All right, the character and actions of those who are intimate with God. So, you know, God created us to have a relationship with Him. Uh, prayer is communication in a relationship where God talks to us and we talk to Him. And... If since he is the greater power, we listen to him first, and then we respond to what he says, and then you can pop in any other request at the end. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, the place of his presence? Who may dwell in your holy hill, place on where his, his temple was? Uh, a certain kind of person. Those who believe in Jesus. No, it doesn't say that. He or she or they who walk uprightly. Now, here's a phrase that's going to come up in these next group of verses. I should have highlighted this group. Who works righteousness. What in the world is that? Okay, walk uprightly means you do what's right. Uh, Sadiq is the word for righteousness, Yesher is the one for upright, and it's a reference to um, the trees that after a storm are still upright. So who walks the right path the right way, who's wise. But then there's another one who works what is righteous, who works what's right in God's sight, that even goes beyond commands. And then here's part of the key, who in their heart speaks truth. Their self-talk is not bad parental tapes. Their self-talk is not um, fables. It's the truth. And it's in their heart. He, who does not backbite with his tongue. Backbite's a great word. Just think about what that means. <laughs> you go up to someone whose back is turned to you and you bite them. <laughs> You know, cats sometimes do this. You know, they get excited and they bite you. But normally, they don't jump on your back and bite you. We do that. Who backbites with his tongue. Notice the tongue doesn't have teeth, but it can do harm. Nor does evil to his neighbor. All right, that's like a transgression. Plotting evil, speaking evil. And doesn't take up a reproach against his enemy. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Does not take up a reproach against his friend, neighbor, companion. What is a reproach? Look it up. Um, I remember looking it up. Okay. It, and it has a, uh, you're, it, it basically could equate eventually to criticism that is maybe probably not warranted. Um, it's something that 
happens when if you reprove someone, uh, they feel guilty and they blame you for reproving them. Uh, so those are things that relate to you and it's necessary to walk uprightly and not do the bad stuff. And that way you can abide with God. But wait, there's more. Now, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. Oh, we must be more tolerant. We must be concerned about humanitarian aid to people. Uh, are, are the people uh, vile, evil, or not? There are evil people. We've seen that recently in our on the global scale. The amount of evil that is prevalent in our world today, it, it's not just that we're hearing more about it. It has really gotten way worse. Uh, I'm not a news junkie, uh, but you know, for people who do spend a lot of time on the news, uh, they are really concerned about uh, evil. And people, Christians are supposed to say, oh, we're supposed to love people. Okay, good. We're supposed to do what's in their best interest. Is it in the best interest of a vile person to continue being vile and suffer an eternity of pain as a result? Uh, is it in the best interest for a person, let's say, who cuts off their life by seven years through smoking to be encouraged to smoke? There are things that cut a person's life even shorter, and, but we say, oh, we're supposed to just accept them. Um, well, no, a vile person is not honored. The one that gets honored are those who fear the Lord, who do what the scriptures say, because that's what the Lord says. And then another piece, who swears to their own hurt and does not change. Oh, you're not supposed to swear. <laughs> who basically has made a vow or a promise and who keep their vow even though it hurts. So you don't want to that vow rashly. But basically, they make vows, they keep them. Who does not put his money out at usury. This does not mean you don't invest in closed end funds or treasuries or things that give you good returns. <laughs> uh, usury is you take advantage of a person by charging 25% interest. Oh, that's what credit card companies do. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you take advantage of people who are uh, poor and uh, you profit at their expense. Remember when Nehemiah came back, uh, he got on the case of the, the Jews who were uh, basically charging their fellow Jews interest who does not take a bribe against the innocent. Um, okay. This is a vile person. Uh, a lot of them sit on, uh, judicial benches in our country nowadays. And for maybe I'm sure a lot of them are getting money, uh, but for getting more fame and power, they will, uh, condemn the innocent. The one who does these things shall never be moved. So this is a really good psalm. It's got requirements. And uh, fearing the Lord is, if we fear the Lord, we will honor those who fear the Lord as well. So next time, we will pick up the second part of this uh, on who may ascend to the hill of the Lord. All these things are to develop a relationship with God to get blessed and have you have a future in this life and the next that you really want, but you got to do something. And for the most part, we got to do something differently than what we're currently doing. Wisdom is figure out why you are where you are and then figure out what you have to do to get where you really want to be and then um, do it. And we'll talk next time about what it means to actually work righteousness. Hey, Bill. Hey, what? Hey, hey, I have a question. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you referenced the article you sent out about, you know, syncing up your brain waves with those uh, who you spend the most time with. And I, I don't know if the article specifically says it, but I think it's, it's a known kind of fact that you become like the top five people that, that you hang around. So, I mean, What's, what's a practical application of that? Should I be evaluating uh, or identifying the, the people that I spend the most time with and 
you know, like a lot of them are going to be my coworkers who I can't help but spend the time with. So should I be on guard that I'm not picking up, you know, their complaining habits or their pessimism or do I need to be evaluating? Do I actually need to be spending all this time with this person? Great question and great answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I was going to say, number one, work remotely. <laughs> Jack, you, you got that. Um, you want to um, develop relationships with folks to seek to influence them uh, towards God because that is loving them and that's in their best interest. However, you don't want to evaluate, I mean, not, you don't want to emulate their bad behavior. So, you need to be purposeful in your interaction. Uh, a lot of times people hang with folks uh, for companionship, worth and value. Uh, remember, one of the bad toil objectives is to use others to, actually, the, almost all the relationship objectives that are bad fall under using others to get your needs met. Um, and I, I even know people who have used, tried to use others to, you know, get their needs for looking good in ministry met. So, uh, you need to have a really tight relationship with the Lord, uh, you, so that you are immune, you have the right set of values, you have kind of dug down deep <clears throat> and made sure that your armor <clears throat> is unassailable. And you need to have some lifelines put out for those uh, to, to not uh, get stuck in the swamp when you're in there trying to rescue people. Uh, you need some relationships. You need other people uh, in the body who knows what are going on in your life and are committed to your best interest. And you need to trust them that God is using them in your life for your benefit. Um, you know, there's going to be things, iron sharpens iron, sparks will fly. Um, you, you need to recognize that you, you want to walk with the wise, so you be wise. So you do want to think about uh, who are people you admire, what do you admire about them. Uh, you want to figure out, ask them if how they got there, and... Uh, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You want to develop a Christ-like lifestyle. Now, he did party with pagans, but he didn't get his worth and value from doing that. Uh, he was bringing truth and light into their lives. Uh, Zacchaeus, I gotta, I'm got going to have dinner at your house tonight. Uh, and he had a positive influence on them. We live in a culture that is hostile towards Christianity. So we need to um, really be on guard that we are not deceived. Do not be deceived. Bad companions corrupt good intentions and morals and behavior and blessings. So, um, yeah, your coworkers, uh, I'm actually going to deal with this a little more when I actually pull together the sermon on that. Uh, they are kind of problematic. You uh, need to be purposeful in your interactions with them. Uh, so, uh, you, you, people will, res okay, so from what I've heard, uh, people will respect you for your convictions if you are true to them. Um, and you need to be true to them because they are watching. They, they because there's going to be a difference between you and them. And we don't want to totally obscure that difference, but uh, we want to be wise. I mean, it, it all comes back to being guided by the Spirit. So you need to, you know, in your personal life, be receptive to the, how the Spirit of God wants you to, what He wants you to do. And then He guides you in where He wants you to go and how He wants you to act. And He's got the power to protect you and the power to bless you. That's a really good question. Uh, you want to minimize the contact with people that are hostile towards God. What do you do with your family members? Well, look at the end of Luke, was it chapter I gave, 11 or 14? Um, you know, 
Jesus did not come to bring peace. He actually did come to bring division. So you need to be purposeful in your interaction with them. And you need to evaluate, okay, how is this relationship working out? How does it affect me and how does it affect the other person? Who's affecting who? Uh, and for, you know, for some of the people, the answer is going to be, um, I really need to be on my guard that I not be affected and you know, pray, lead me not in temptation, but deliver me from this evil. And God has the power to do that. Um, but if you, you got to just be careful who's meeting your needs. Um, so if God is meeting your needs and God is pleased with you, that will be more important to you than what any other person thinks. Um, I kind of got became a pretty immune to peer pressure at a very young age because the uh, negative pressures, I'm talking about even, you know, fifth grade, uh, were pretty significant. So, great question. Uh, we'll revisit that in oh, probably next month whenever I get through the blessing stuff and I can figure out what to say on the other stuff. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you um, are a God who uh, are all sufficient for all our needs. Uh, you created us with needs. You have a perfect plan for fulfilling them. Uh, you tell us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, just how to experience that good, acceptable, and perfect plan. And it is by being uh, different from the world around us at the core of our being as well as in our actions. So we can then go into that world like Jesus did and uh, come out victorious and uh, hopefully uh, leading others from darkness into light. Uh, thank you for being really clear about what you want us to do. And uh, thank you that uh, you preserve your word through all these years. It's all over your word. And uh, you make it so we can understand it. So I pray your spirit would work in us to willing to do your good pleasure because we do live to please you. And thank you that you, you pay us back beyond all that we could ask or think. Eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what you have prepared for those who love you. So Lord, help us love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. For your glory, in Christ's name, amen.